Welcome to Spine Academy. In this video, we're going to discuss the anterior cervical corpectomy and fusion. This is an excerpt from a broader course in which we discuss on a high level the many different types of cervical spine surgery. If you're interested in seeing the full course, we've left a link in the description. The lion's share of anterior cervical procedures are really anterior cervical discectomy infusions and anterior cervical disc replacements. But there is one procedure that I want to talk about which isn't quite as common but is still very valuable and powerful, and that procedure is called the anterior cervical corpectomy and fusion. So let's take a step back again and look at some cervical pathology. Imagine a simple case like this where you can see that there's a disc herniation at this C5-6 level causing some pressure on the spinal cord. And, and you may have seen this image before. This is a very simple case of a single level disc herniation. Now of course discs can wear out at multiple levels and you might have an image that looks like this where you can see that there's some disc degeneration with some disc extrusion kind of pushing on the spinal cord at the C4-5 and also C5-6 and C6-7. And you can see there can be multi-level pathology. Now when a disc spits out, it doesn't always spit out directly backwards. Sometimes like at this 6-7 level, you can see it spits backwards and kind of down a little bit behind the C7 level. And so disc herniation sometimes can migrate a little bit. When people have a disc herniation that goes behind the vertebral body, we call that retrovertebral stenosis. So another example of that might be a picture that looks like this. And here you can see that there is some disc degeneration at the C4-5 and C5-6 level. C5-6 is pushing kind of straight back. But you can see here the C4-5 disc extrusion, you can see there's disc material pushing back a little bit behind 4 and really predominantly behind the vertebral body of C5. So that is called retrovertebral stenosis because it's behind the vertebral body of 5. Now when people have disc herniations like that, it's very hard to get to from from the front and take out with a discectomy. Because if you were to go in from here and try to take this out, you can see here how you could get some of this stuff back, but to get this stuff that's kind of sticking down and back and, and kind of uh, downwards behind the body of five, you maybe could get a nerve hook and a microscope and pull on it, but there's a little bit of jeopardy to the spinal cord, especially if the spinal cord is tight. Now in situations like that, we generally favor a procedure called a corpectomy. And that is a procedure where you remove this block because it allows you to decompress this disc, get any of the disc material that's behind it, and really decompress the spinal cord very well. So after taking out that vertebral body and the disc, it may look something like this. Here you can see again C2, 3, 4, and you can see C5 is missing here. The disc between C4 and 5 and the disc between C5 and 6, what you could see over here, the 4, 5, and the 5, six levels, like those are gone. But so is the disc material that was pressing back here, and so the spinal cord looks very well decompressed between C4 and C6. All of the stuff that is ventral to the spinal cord has been removed. So that is called a corpectomy because you're removing the corpus or the body itself of C5. The vertebral body, it's full resection or most complete resection of, of the C5, in this case vertebral body, we call that a cervical corpectomy. And because it's done from the front, it's an anterior cervical corpectomy. Now to fill this gap, you have to put something in it. And so that is how you achieve the fusion part of it. So here you can see, for example, you can fill it with a piece of bone. And in this case, you can see there's a gap between C4 and C6, usually you'll kind of countersink it by kind of cutting a little bit into here and a little bit into here into those adjacent end plates that leaves a little groove in the back here or something to kind of prevent the, the graft from spinning backwards into the spinal cord. That's traditionally how I do a corpectomy in terms of putting the graft. That graft material can either be your own bone, something that we call autograft, could be fibular or iliac crest, like in terms of where it comes from. That's quite rare. We will use that in situations where there's really a bad infection or maybe a bad tumor or radiation or kind of extenuating circumstances. Generally taking a piece of your own bone that big can be pretty painful and we don't generally do that if we can avoid it. You can also use cadaver bone. That's another uh, thing that you can use there. And there's different types of cadaver bone that you can get that kind of you can use to fill this hole. 
Now, regardless of what you put in there, you generally will put a plate on the front and the plate will have screws that go into, in this case, C4 and C6, but will go into the remaining levels adjacent to it to kind of hold those bones together, even to compress down a little bit on that spacer to hold everything in alignment until bone can grow into it from C4 into the, into the graft and from C6 into the graft until it becomes one cohesive solid piece. Now, this is if you want to use a piece of bone, but there are other options. You can also use something called an inner body vertebral body replacement device, or some people call it an expandable cage. It, it can be made out of different materials. In this case, we're illustrating something made out of metal. Uh, in this case, probably titanium. That's a classic metal that we would use for it. And these devices go in kind of small and can be expanded. That's why we call them expandable cages. There's different mechanisms for them, but it allows you to kind of expand it to fill the space until this end plate or end cap, as some people call them, engages the adjacent bone. Now, what's kind of nice about these expandable cages is that you can kind of place them, make sure you like where they are and expand them to fit them. So it tends to be a little bit easier to size and contour and make sure that it engages the bone well. It also, unlike the bone graft where you have to countersink them, you don't necessarily have to disrupt the end plate at all because these end plates, end caps, typically have little pins that help kind of hold them and engage it. So it kind of sets a little bit. It's like got feet that kind of dig into the bone a little bit and prevent it from moving at all. So I have a lot less anxiety about this thing migrating or changing position because of that. Now, one of the nice things about not having to take off the end plate is by preserving bone on those adjacent levels, you, you don't have to worry so much about something called subsidence. When you you have to cut out a little bit or countersink it, you remove kind of the hard part of the bone and seat it a little, you seat the bone or other thing on kind of softer bone that's underneath the end plate. You have to do that when you countersink it. And so that tends to cause a little bit of settling or what we call subsidence where the spacer can kind of piston into the adjacent bones. That can change the alignment. Now, having said that, I like expandable cages for that reason, but depending on the clinical circumstances, sometimes bone does make better sense. Regardless of whether you put a piece of bone or put some type of spacer, regardless of whether it's made out of metal or made out of a type of plastic or whatever it is, you still typically will put a plate on the front of it and typically put screws in to kind of hold those bones together. So that is how a cervical corpectomy is done. It is generally done to remove something that looks like this, where you have all of this retrovertebral stenosis, and then putting a much bigger spacer in to allow to kind of fill that gap that you've created with the plate on the front to get it to fuse. In summary, if you look at an anterior cervical corpectomy and fusion, we'll talk about some of the features of those. The decompression that it allows, again, because it's from the front, allows for removal of ventral pathology or anterior pathology. You can take the pressure off on right or left or both sides. It's excellent for removal of bone spurs, removal of discs. It's generally reserved for situations where the disc is behind the vertebral body. Um, those are the situations where corpectomy can be really powerful. Most of the time in my practice, I use it for removal of one vertebral body. Usually when you take out one vertebral body, you take out the disc above it and the disc below it. So it's typically two discs or two levels and one vertebral body. You can do more than that. You can do a corpectomy at one level and maybe a discectomy at the level above it. You can even do multiple uh, level vertebral body resection or something that's called a, a multi-level corpectomy. All of that is possible, although certainly much less common. When you do this procedure, it does require a fusion. That means you put the plate on, you're putting some type of graft material in there, and you're trying to get the bones to all glue together or fuse together. There is some controversy about whether a corpectomy is worse for alignment. And as I mentioned, when you put in a piece of bone, you often have to take off some of the adjacent end plates. That creates some risk of pistoning or subsidence. So I have found in those situations that you may not be able to get as good an alignment correction as with an ACD. But with the advent of these expandable cages, I find that that's a little bit different, that you can get pretty good lordosis restoration and preserve it with less risk of subsidence. Having said that, the, the role of an anterior cervical corpectomy is for ventral decompression when a discectomy alone is not enough. It's a very powerful tool for degenerative conditions in which that's the case. But a clinical situation where I see it much more valuable is when people have tumors or sometimes traumatic or even infectious pathologies that can require the removal of a bone. It's a workhorse technique in those situations and a valuable thing to have in your skill set if you're a spine surgeon. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it informative. If you've enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. 
If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future content, we'd welcome them in the comment section below.